Good morning. Welcome to Bible Believers Community Church. This is our Sunday school lesson on the book of Romans. We're certainly glad to have you here with us. We appreciate the folks on the internet. Thank you for tuning in and, and um, be sure and subscribe if you haven't. Share us, like us, all that good stuff. Not going to dwell on that. Pray for us. I'll dwell on that. Pray for us because the um, fervent prayers the effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. So pray for us. We appreciate that. Pray that the Lord would help us to grow numerically and 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 just pray for us to be uh, blessed by the Lord. We appreciate that. We like being blessed. And so anyway, we're in the we're studying the book of Romans now. We're about to embark on an in-depth study on the book of Romans, and Romans is the first letter contained in the Pauline epistles uh, written to the to uh, the people of Rome and it's the Pauline epistles that are specifically written for the church age as Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles and so as we got ready to start this thing I mean we're four weeks into it and we haven't even looked at Romans 1 1 yet but if you come to know me, you know that I'm not in a rush. And so we started by laying a foundation of dispensationalism. If you miss that, you need to go and, and look at those two messages. That was in two parts. And um, the next two lessons, because this will be our fourth lesson. So last week and this week, we're looking at the history, the history of Romans. And then we should be able to get started on Romans chapter 1, verse 1 next week. But we, we determined that in order to fully grasp and understand Romans, you need to rightly divide the word of truth. And that's why we started off with the foundation of dispensationalism. And before we get started on this week's lesson, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we do thank you for this time. We praise you for all the good that you do for us. And there certainly is a lot of good that you do for us. We thank you for all of it. We praise you for your... Um, loving kindness towards us and that you gave us salvation when we didn't deserve it. You loved us when we didn't love you and that in turn turned our love towards you and we're grateful, Lord. Thank you for all that you do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And if I forgot to say bless this meeting today, let's, let's just take for granted that I want this meeting today blessed. So one of the things we saw when we first started looking at um, the book of Romans and the history of it, we saw that it was written somewhere around 58 AD. And um, we talked about the importance of that timeline and, and I made a statement that maybe some people disagree with. The majority of the scholars, and you know I'm not a huge respecter of scholars, but the majority of the scholars will put the date somewhere around 58 AD. And I made a statement, like I said, some people probably disagree with it, but I think it's a true statement. There's nothing that can be done historically to prove like within a year when the, the Pauline epistles, each one of them was written. <coughs> and so with that being said, I mean, it's a range. That's why I say it was written around 58 AD. It might've been 56, 57, it might've been 59 or 60. I don't think so. I think 58 is pretty doggone close. And so that, then we started looking at Paul's specific calling because Paul was called to a specific ministry. Quickly, let's look at Romans chapter 15 and verse 16. Romans 15, 16. And I don't go into depth when we look at these references in Romans because we're gonna go into depth in, in them when we get to them in our study. But Paul says that I should be minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. So Paul's calling was specifically to the Gentiles and, and specifically the gospel that's going out to the Gentiles. Now, that's Paul's office. He is the apostle to the Gentiles. Look at Romans 11, verse 13. Romans 11 and verse 13. Paul says, 
For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Now, I took a bit of time to show that Paul was not magnifying himself because some people think that he was, and he wasn't. He was magnifying the office that he was given. He, he fully understood what his calling was from God. And so his heart wasn't necessarily to the Gentiles. I don't think he was anti-Gentile. But man, if you go through the Pauline epistles, he's constantly just yearning for Israel, his, his brothers in the Jewish faith. He wanted them to accept their Messiah. But his office was to the Gentiles. He recognized that and he magnified his office. Look over at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7. 1 Timothy 2, verse 7. Uh, I'm just going through some stuff to show you that, that Paul had a very specific uh, ministry. In 1 Timothy 2, 7, he says, Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. So Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. He's a teacher to the Gentiles. And, and that's important to understand as we get ready to look at the Pauline epistles. Uh, the last one we're going to look at is 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 11. 2 Timothy 1, 11, uh, Paul says, Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. So the current time that we live in is considered the time of the Gentiles. The age that we're living in, known as the church age, is the age of the Gentiles. Israel rejected their Messiah, just like the Old Testament prophesied that they would. They, the Old Testament is filled with prophecies um, about the first and second advent. And sometimes you see both in one verse separated by a comma. There'll be something that says about the Messiah that's the first advent, and a comma in the rest of the verse is the second advent. The problem for Israel was that probably two thirds of the, um, and probably even more than that, probably 80% of all the prophecies of their coming Messiah were second advent. And so the Jews were looking for a conquering king that was going to come down and overthrow the governments of the earth and put Israel into their own kingdom where they kind of ran everything on earth. Kind of upset the Gentiles and said that there's been anti-Semitism forever <laughs> because people hate the Jews because they're God's chosen people and people hate God. That's the reality of it. And so the Old Testament prophesied that they were going to reject their Messiah throughout the Old Testament. And you see it oftentimes directly in connection with the, the references that are for the first advent. And so the Jews missed the first advent looking for the second advent. They missed the verses that talked about him riding into Jerusalem on the back of a, of a cult, uh, the, uh, the cult of an ass, and um, which came to pass. He did that. They missed the part about him being a suffering lamb led to the slaughter. Um, they missed all that because they were expecting that conquering king. And so they missed all that. And, and yet it's all in there. And it all came to pass. As a matter of fact, there was a statistician that did some work. And I don't, I, I mean, I'm going to be just throwing out there a number that means nothing because I don't, I didn't memorize what this statistician came up with. But just the Old Testament prophecies of what the first advent would look like and the life of Christ and what took place in the life of Christ, the statistician basically said, there's no chance that Christ was not the first advent and the coming Messiah. There's just, it's, it's statistically um, impossible for somebody to have fulfilled, even if they were trying to, even if they were born and became a studious uh, scholar of the Old Testament and decided I'm gonna go and match all these prophecies so that I can be worshiped they couldn't have done it. This statistician just pretty much proved through actual statistics that Jesus is the Messiah of Israel and it could be nobody else. And so because of Israel rejecting their Messiah, God has temporarily, temporarily set them aside and he's come for the Gentiles. And, and it's temporary. Uh, look at Romans chapter 11 and verse... Um, uh, 13, we looked at that already, but we're, we're going to go on from that. Romans eleven thirteen. 
Romans 11, 13, we already read it. It says, for I speak to you, Paul's talking. I speak to you Gentiles and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office, but let's keep going. Let's don't stop there. For if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. See, Paul's heart was toward the Jews. And Paul talked about what part of his ministry is, and that is to provoke emulation in the Jew. The Jew's supposed to get jealous over God's new relationship with the Gentiles. Verse 15. For if the casting away of them, who's the casting away of? The Jews, temporarily. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruits be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, that's Israel being broken off from Jesus, who is the tree, the, 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 he says, I am the vine and ye are the branches. Verse 17 again, and if some of the branches be broken off and thou being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and with them partakest of the root of, and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou boast not the root, bearest not the root, uh, but the root thee. So we're nothing in and of ourselves, amen. Verse 19. That will say then the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, and in the and you still see this being used in black churches today. It's almost like amen or um, of a truth or something like that. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. In other words, of a truth, they were broken off. And thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Now, a lot of churches that don't understand dispensational truth and don't understand, they don't rightly divide the word of truth, they take this to be a verse that says you can lose your salvation, but it's talking about a national position. Israel as a nation was broken off of that uh, um, tree, that olive tree, and the Gentiles were grafted in. So when it says, uh, if he spared not the natural branches, the nation of Israel, take heed lest he also spare not thee. All the Gentiles, that's not an individual thing about salvation. Verse 22, and we'll be done with this. Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, severity, but to toward thee goodness if thou continue in his goodness otherwise thou also shall be cut off. And you know what? If you take this and you compare it with biblical prophecy, the age of the Gentiles has an end to it. They're, the Gentiles are going to be cut back off and the natural branches are going to be grafted back in. And that's what this whole thing was about. Paul's given a warning saying, don't get all high-minded. Stay right. Stay focused. The church is not staying right. The church is sitting back idly and quiet and even embracing the LGBTQ and all that garbage and the wokeism and all that stuff. They're embracing it thinking it's showing tolerance and that it's showing that God loves everybody when clearly God doesn't love everybody. Um, we had a message on that. If you disagree with it, go back and read the message because we went through copious scripture that shows that God does not love everybody. He hates all workers of iniquity. Who are all workers of iniquity? Anybody who is not saved. <laughs> you're a worker of iniquity unless you get saved and then your, your soul and your body and your spirit are separated through a spiritual circumcision so that when you sin, it's no longer you, but it's your flesh. It's, it's sin that dwelleth in your flesh. And so now drop down to verse 25 here in our verse. It says, for I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant for this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceit. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So there's going to be a time when the fullness of the Gentiles hit, and it's because of the apostasy of the Gentiles. God's going to, just like he did with the apostasy of Israel, he cut off Israel. He's going to cut off the Gentiles because of the apostasy of the Gentiles. And uh, that's going to end the age of the Gentiles when that fullness of the Gentiles comes in. 
and then that blindness that's been given to Israel in part is going to be removed and they're going to see their Messiah for who he is. So Paul has been appointed to the Gentile, which is a contrast to what Jesus did on earth. Romans 15 and verse 8. Romans 15 and verse 8. Paul says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. He's talking about the nation of Israel. Drop down to verse 16. Paul says that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. So Paul's saying Jesus came and Jesus' outreach was to Israel. And if you don't get that, look at some of those verses in the Gospels where the woman, the Gentile woman came to Jesus with an issue and Jesus ignored her and the apostle said, send her away. And what did Jesus say to her when she kept bugging him? He said, um, I've come only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He didn't come for the Gentiles at that point in time. But after Israel's rejection of their Messiah, uh, the Lord called Paul to now reach out to the Gentiles. That Those natural branches were cut out and the unnatural branches are being grafted in. So Paul's implication is that his ministry is a continuation of Christ's ministry, which it is. Um, and knowing the Bible, this fits perfectly. God's plan has been consistent. He doesn't change his, it, he doesn't change his plan on the fly. He, his plan has always been what his plan is, and his plan is coming to, to pass stage by stage by stage, dispensation by dispensation. A dispensation doesn't end by God going, oh man, that didn't work, I'll try something else. No, a dispensation is a battle plan. And God's plan consisted of seven dispensations, seven steps of his battle against Satan. And each one was planned, each one was known, each one is coming to pass in its, in its entirety. So God's plan's been consistent. He doesn't change it on the fly. Christ fulfilled his ministry but the plan was always to make a path for the Gentiles. Christ fulfilled his ministry, and part of his ministry in that fulfilling was to die for the sins of men and to be crucified and to go to hell for three days, to pay for the sins of those who would trust him, those who would believe in him, those who would recognize them as him as their God, amen? So when we consider Paul's ministry as a continuation of Christ's ministry, that could actually be kind of a scary thing if you stop and think about it. Christ's ministry included suffering, being beaten to a pulp, uh, being, being tortured, being spit on, being humiliated, uh, and ultimately ending uh, with a, the cruel death of crucifixion. Now I said Paul's ministry is a continuation of that. Paul's ministry including suffering, being beaten, being stoned, being jailed, being imprisoned, uh, and eventually martyrdom, martyrdom. <laughs> and uh, every apostle, with the exception of the apostle John, got martyred for the um, cause of Christ, every single one. You say, well, why did John escape it? John is a type of the church, <laughs> and he didn't get martyred. Um, so now here's where we get, where it might get a little concerning for us. Look at 1 Timothy uh, 1 verse 16, 1 Timothy 1 16. First Timothy 1 16. Bible says, how be it for this cause, I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to everlasting life. Paul, all the stuff that he went through and everything that I just talked about, him being stoned, being persecuted, being lied about, having false witnesses against him, it's a pattern of things that are gonna happen to us. <laughs> and so America, we Christians in America have escaped this for centuries centuries. This verse is saying that Paul is a, a pattern of suffering to all who should believe in Christ. It's a pattern. And certainly history confirms this uh, persecution of true Bible-believing Christians. It's gone on throughout all history. It's still going on today. 
Uh, America is just starting to get on the fringe of it. America is going to get into it full force as well. I mean, the tide is turning to where there's more and more liberals that are speaking out against Christians and how Christians shouldn't be allowed to do this, do that, to pray in public, to take their Bibles anywhere. To uh, And so the tide is turning and, and more and more contempt is being shown towards Christmas, Christians. And I'm going to tell you something, the time's coming where even in America, Christians are going to be persecuted. That's coming. Now, I stated early on that baptism is not a part of salvation, but if you want a biblical, because this is a history, if you want a biblical uh, precedent for New Testament baptism, it would be that Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, Paul got uh, baptized after he was saved, after he was saved. So Paul, was baptized but it was after it wasn't a part of salvation it was after this has to soak in because the Church of Christ will use that as an example. See, you have to be baptized in order to be saved. But Paul got baptized after salvation. So that's an important, 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 important concept. So um, now we've talked about how the book of Romans is the foundation for all New Testament doctrines that deal with New Testament salvation. And it is. And it's fitting that this foundation would be uh, laid in the book of Romans. Why? Because Rome is the last world empire in Daniel 2 that is mentioned before the second coming of Christ. Look at Daniel chapter 2 and verse 40. And Daniel comes right after Ezekiel. Some folks have a, um, a difficult time finding it, but Ezekiel is a huge book in the Old Testament. You should be able to find Ezekiel and Daniel is right after Ezekiel. So Daniel chapter 2, look at verse 40, Daniel 2, verse 40. The Bible says, And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all of these shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it uh, of the strength of the iron for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay so the kingdom shall uh, be partly strong and partly broken and whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay they shall be mingled themselves with the seed of men but they shall not cleave one to another even as iron is not mixed with clay and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom and shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it break in pieces, the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain and the interpretation thereof sure. So we see the second coming of Christ in verses 44 and 45. Now, the kingdom builders, I refer to people as kingdom builders. And I'm going to define that as we go on a little bit. The kingdom builders, which includes Islam. It includes the Roman Catholic Church. And it includes pretty much every Protestant church. And they teach that Christ established a the theocratic kingdom right after his resurrection. And there's nothing further from the truth. It's kind of like there's a spiritual kingdom. And, and it's just not true. This theology brings with it the doctrine of works. that yeah. it, it comes with it because the idea is that God has established his kingdom. It's already established. And now it's up to us to continue to improve until that kingdom can be ready for him to come and sit on his throne. 
the kingdom builders. That's the whole idea. They think that man has some input and influence on when that kingdom comes, and we don't. We have nothing to do with that kingdom. That kingdom has not been established yet. That kingdom will be established at the second advent. Right now, men are, are supposed to just submit themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a time of testing. It's a time of, of, uh, of God's redemptive plan for the whole entire Gentile nations. But this idea of, of the kingdom builders, it, it's a post-millennial approach to the scriptures. And, and the Presbyterians believe this as well as the Calvinists. However, they changed the name from post-millennialism because they know that you can disprove post-millennialism. So they call it uh, theonomy, theonomy or reconstructionism. And really what it's saying is post-millennialism. So what does post-millennial millennial mean? The proper interpretation of the Bible is pre-millennial. That means the Lord is gonna come back to establish his kingdom, pre-millennial. He's coming back before the millennial reign of Christ. Uh, amillennial means, I don't, ah just means I don't know. I don't know when he's coming back. And then there's post-millennial, post means after. So they're saying man establishes the kingdom yeah. and then God comes back after the kingdom has been established. And that's, it's, it's stupid, man doesn't have, it, for man to, to, to cling to that doctrine, You'd have to conclude that man is getting more and more spiritual, more and more right with God, more and more, uh, you know, everything's getting better and improving when just the opposite is true. Man is getting more and more apostate. Man, and man, man is getting more and more acceptance, accepting of sin. Man is getting more and more driven away from God. Man is, is throwing out doctrine for the sake of unity. I, I think that these post-millennialists believe that, um, um, unity what is what's going to bring in the kingdom. So doctrine doesn't matter. What matters is unity. And yet that's totally 100% contrary to the word of God. Doctrine matters. Amen. And so uh, no matter what you call it, whether you call it post-millennialism, theonomy, or reconstructionism, no matter what you call it, it's wrong. It's not biblical. Uh, so why Rome? Why did Paul write to Rome? Well, let's just stop and think about it for a minute. It was Rome who nailed Jesus Christ to the cross. It was Rome who put the spear in his side. It was Rome who tried to murder him as soon as he was born. It was Rome who beheaded all of his apostles with the exception of John, or killed them, might not be beheaded, but killed them. Is it appropriate that Paul's letter starts with Rome? Since that time, it is still Rome that persecutes true believers. It's still Rome. Um, it's still Rome that went after the martyrs who rejected their false doctrines. It was Rome that started the inquisitions. It was Rome that embarked on the great crusades, torturing and killing true Bible believers who refused to recant of their faith in Christ uh, or of their devotion to the Bible and to God. They refuse to do that, and, and it's Rome. It's Rome. Never an apology offered for any of the history of Rome. They've never, they acknowledge it. If you go and look at Romans, Roman Catholics have their own history books, and if you go and look at those history books, they acknowledge the Inquisitions. They acknowledge the Great Crusades. They acknowledge all that that took place, and they even acknowledge it in the gruesome, gory, bloody mess that it was, and you know what's missing? An apology saying, you know, we were wrong. We were overzealous. We were zealous without knowledge. You never see that because they're not sorry. And they'd do it again in a minute if they thought that they could politically get away with it. So back to Daniel chapter two, the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have to turn there. The Lord Jesus Christ does not show up to set up his literal kingdom until well after Rome and its religious system have been totally destroyed. I showed you how in Daniel 2 that Rome is the last earthly man-made kingdom prior to the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's still a lot of influence in all governments from Rome. You may not believe that, but it's true. If you do a little bit of research, you'll find out that it's true. Rome is still to a large degree running the world. So the two legs on Daniel's image were the two branches of Rome, which include 
the Greek Orthodox Church, the Greek Orthodox Church from the east side of the empire, and the Roman Catholic Church from the west. Hmm, that's interesting, isn't it? We know this happens after their destruction because the smiting stone doesn't hit the legs, it hits the feet. Let that soak in for a minute. The chief theme of all the Pauline epistles, getting back to our, our um, history of Rome, the chief theme of all the Pauline epistles is faith, is faith. He never sets up a church state anywhere. Uh, he never joins a church with any government anywhere. So when you see churches that are connected with governments, there's not a biblical precedence for that. When you see a church state where the church dictate or the state dictates what church you can attend, there's no biblical precedence for that. That's man uh, building their own kingdoms and trying to force people into their uh, theology in order to control the people. That's what that's all about. He never connects New Testament Christianity with any form of government or any political party. And people, Americans right now are listening to this and they're saying, uh, see there, the, the America has a right, separation of church and state. Yet true Christian churches have kind of identified themselves with the Republican Party, like the Republican Party is some kind of Christian organization, which it isn't. It isn't. Now, I will agree that the Republican Party is probably more conservative in most cases and they're not woke and they're not trying to promote the at least not openly trying to promote the LGBTQ and all the sinful things that are going on. And so if you, if you pick the least of two evils, the Republican Party, which is still evil, still taking us to, they're still marching down the same direction, folks. They may be doing it on a different path, but they're still heading to a one world government. They're still heading to a one world currency. They're still heading for the unity of all nations under the Antichrist. They are. And so, but if they're in power, the thing will slow down some. My personal preference is I'm not sure I want it to slow down some. Even so, come Lord Jesus, amen, <laughs> amen. So Paul never sprinkles any babies for baptism. Paul never talks about baptismal regeneration or baptism being a part of salvation. He never once references that. Never once sprinkles a baby. Never once talks about sprinkling babies. So all these kingdom building churches like the Presbyterians, the Lutherans, the Catholics, they say that if you don't get your baby baptized when they're just a little teeny baby, if they die like of SIDS, uh, sudden death, uh, sudden infant death syndrome, um, they go to hell because they weren't baptized. Well, that's nonsense. That child had no say because it has to be a conscious decision on the part of the human being to accept Christ. And the Bible says where there is no law, there is no transgression of the law. There is a, a point of innocence in every human being where if they die, even without accepting Christ, they're going to go to heaven because they aren't aware of the sin or, or how they've done God wrong. And so when somebody becomes aware, we call that the age of accountability, where they become aware that they've sinned against a holy God. And that's when they have to accept Christ as their Savior or they go to hell. You say, well, what age is that? It varies drastically from kid to kid. I've been told by, I, I kind of question this tongue in cheek. I question it, but it doesn't mean that it's wrong. I've been told by some missionaries and by some preacher friends that they had a child that got saved at the age of three. I have a hard time figuring that a kid at three years old can figure out that they sinned against a holy God and that, uh, that they need a, a salvation uh, through a Messiah. Um, I have a hard time fathoming that, but I, I can't say that it isn't true. I mean, there's like 12 year olds who graduated from college. So, so I'm not saying it's not true. I'm just saying that if you're, if you're a parent that, that puts pressure on your kid to get saved and they get saved at three, did they really get saved or did they just respond to the pressure you're putting on them? A parent is far better to not put any pressure on the kid and let the Holy Spirit do his job and when the Holy Spirit convicts them of sin, they're gonna to come to the parents and say, what do I need to do? I know that I'm in a bad condition and that's prime ground for them getting saved. So another thing you never see Paul do, he never uses candles or prayer beads or prayer wheels. Amen. Uh, he, he never does any of that nonsense. He never makes any pilgrimage to any holy place. Never, 
Never once. There's no biblical precedence for that. And this is going to sound blunt to some folks, but it's the truth. He never gives Mary the time of day. <laughs> he, he, he never does anything to exalt Mary. He doesn't even mention her. Um, so he never engages in arresting, torturing, or killing anybody who makes fun of his religion or stands against his religion. That's all nonsense. It's not godly. Uh, Christians should not, Christians, according to the Bible, Christians should be passive. We're supposed to be like Christ. Christ never fought back. <laughs> Christ could have won the battle just like that. He never fought back. He submitted to it. And that's, I believe, the pattern that we're supposed to follow. I know some Christians don't like that. I've had Christians say, well, that's your take on it. I, I think that we have the right to defend ourselves and our families. And if that's your take, do what you feel like the Lord would have you to do. Amen. I'm not the Lord. I'm telling you that when I look at my Bible and look at the examples given in my Bible, Paul never said, let's mount up and go attack. You know, they're persecuting us, let's fight back. No, they submitted to it. Amen, amen, amen. Preacher, I don't like that. It's in the book. <laughs> if you don't like it, you don't like what the book says. It has nothing to do with me. I'm telling you what the book says. So no Gentile should be basing their fundamental theological doctrines on Simon Peter. Peter's the apostle to the Jew, um, and that's identified in the Bible. The Gentiles should be basing their fundamental theological doctrines on Romans through Philemon because those are the Pauline epistles. Now, it must be closely observed that I said foundational theology. I didn't say you throw out First and Second Peter. I didn't say you throw out the Gospels. I didn't say you throw out the Old Testament. I said that your foundational theology for this age has to come from the Pauline epistles. And this is all important, foundational to the study of the book of Romans. And I would never suggest you throw the other books of the Bible out. Never. And that's what hyper-dispensationalism does. But we benefit from them. The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable. So we gain from all the other books. And here is a very simple, basic, biblical rule for studying the Bible. And it's something that I want you to pay close attention to. If any verse in either testament does not contradict or deny something found in a Pauline epistle, it can be applied to the New Testament Christian. Let me repeat that. Any verse in either testament or any other epistle, even if it's not Pauline, that does not contradict or deny something found in a Pauline epistle, it can be applied to the New Testament Christian. There are literally hundreds of verses in the Old Testament that are applicable to Christian belief and conduct. Hundreds of them. They line up with the Pauline epistles. And so somebody doesn't understand this, somebody doesn't understand rightly dividing the word of truth, that's why they come up with there's contradictions in the Bible because there's things that are required of this age that weren't required in other ages. And if you don't know how to rightly divide the word of truth, it appears to be a contradiction, but it's not. The thing is you have to understand uh, is this, once a verse is pulled out from any other author, including the four gospels, that contradicts a Pauline doctrinal statement, that verse doesn't apply to the church. It applies to whatever dispensation contextually that verse is coming from. So words are important. And I stated doctrinal, doctrinal statement, any doctrinal statement that is in contradiction. Um, I didn't say inspirational statements. I didn't say devotional teachings. I said any doctrinal statement that is contrary to a Pauline epistle, it applies to a different dispensation. Paul is the apostle to the Gentile. In the age we live in, the church age, the church is the body of Christ. It's not uh, Roman. The church is not Roman. It never has been, never will be. It's not American. There's some folks that think America is a Christian nation. There's no such thing as a Christian nation. Never has been, never will be. Um, I'm not even sure that we could call it the kingdom. When Christ comes back and establishes his kingdom on earth, 
I'm not sure that we could call that kingdom a Christian nation because it's going to be a godly nation. You're going to have Israel still doing the things that Israel does. <laughs> You're going to have uh, the 12 tribes setting up a, 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 a um, it's not going to be a democracy, a theocracy. That would be the way to put it because Christ is going to be a king on earth and he's going to be a, a, a god as a king. So. Um, America is, is not the church, never has been, never will be. It's not Islam, never has been, never will be. It is a spiritual body, and we're going to start next week with Romans chapter 1, verse 1, and we're going to start digging into all the implications of everything that I just stated, not just this week, but the last four weeks of getting ready to start our study of the book of Romans. There's all that stuff that I said has serious implications and we're gonna dig into that, we're gonna study it. And uh, I hope that you're gonna really enjoy this. Uh, God bless you all, let's go to Lord in prayer. Lord, we do thank you for this time that we had together. We praise you for all the love that you bestow upon us. We pray that you would just anoint this whole study on the book of Romans, help people to understand things in ways maybe they never have seen it before. Certainly, uh, in today's modern churches, these teachings are disappearing. I'm not saying that we're the only church, Lord. There's um, 5,000 that haven't bowed their knee to Baal, but, but Lord, it's getting fewer and far, farther between. Most churches are just devotional, entertaining um, social clubs these days, and, and I'm sorry for that. I wish that we still stayed focused on your word like your intention was. Help us, Lord. Help us to grow. Help us to reach more people. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.